Welcome back, this is the Tutor Wizard. I'm Adrian, this is Petra. Please subscribe right there. We're doing Linear Algebra 1. This is Chapter 3, Geometric Vectors, Lines, and Planes. This time we're doing Section 3.2, which is Linear Combinations and Spanning Sets. I know that's exciting. This lecture specifically, what we're going to do is further properties of vectors. Squeeze them in because I forgot it in the last one. And then we're going to do Linear Combinations and Spanning Sets with some examples. Let's get to it. All right, further properties of geometric vectors. Let u be an arbitrary geometric vector and let alpha be an arbitrary scalar, which when we see a scalar, we mean a real number. Then we have these five properties. First of all, I don't know if we talked about this, but this inverse, this additive inverse or negative is unique. Also, we're gonna have, if you multiply any arbitrary vector, whether it's zero or not, by the number zero, you're always gonna get the zero vector. If you take any arbitrary real number and multiply it by the zero vector, you're also going to get the zero vector. If you multiply a vector by negative one, that is the additive inverse of that vector, which is unique. And then if you have that scalar multiple of a vector times some number gives you the zero vector, either alpha is the zero number or u is the zero vector. Let's prove a couple of these properties. We're going to prove one, two, and four. We're going to leave three and five for the viewer as an exercise. For the first one, the negative u is unique. For simplicity, I'm going to use c and d so I don't have to index or anything like this. But the real axiom says if you have two inverses additively, we would have that the inverse plus u will give us zero, and u plus that inverse will give us zero. Suppose we have two of them. What I'm going to do is start with this one, say. Then what we're going to do is starting from this, I have u plus c is equal to zero. From here, what I can do is add this other guy, D, to both sides, and let's see what happens. Let's add D on the left on both sides. Then that gives us D plus U plus C. I've added it on this side. It's going to equal D plus zero. Now, first of all, what I'm going to use on this side is I know that from the previous axioms, four, I believe, zero plus any vector leaves it alone, so I know that that will just be a D. On this side, what I'm going to do is associate the brackets first. I'm allowed to associate brackets. That's going to give me, that's axiom 3. That's going to give me D plus U plus C is equal to D. This is now D plus U. I know it is the zero vector. And same again, I know that zero plus C leaves C alone. So that has to say our conclusion. Those two things are the same. Therefore, if you have an additive inverse, there's only one of them. I'm going to use that right away to prove, I can't remember which one it is, four, I believe. Let's prove two first. All right, to start this one off, first of all, let's remind us of a few of the axioms of the real numbers. Zero plus a is always a. Everyone always nods. Actually, let's write it backwards. a equals a plus zero. What that says is if you just have a, you can introduce zero anytime you want. In particular, zero equals zero plus zero. Usually we write it the other way around and then you focus, you're like, clearly, yeah, you can make two zeros, you can collapse it to one. It's more important is you can just introduce one anytime you want. And this is cleverly what I'm going to use first. From this, I see that this gives me zero is actually how to, this is what we're trying to show. So I'm just going to start with the left hand side and hope I can manipulate and turn it into zero. This is going to give me zero times u. And I'm going to use this axiom right here. That's actually equal to zero plus zero. U. Now I'm going to use distribution. I believe axiom 9. A single vector can be distributed onto two scalars. They're both 0. So this will be 0u plus 0u. Now I can cut out the middleman for simplicity. What we just showed well, what we just showed was 0 times u is equal to 0 times u plus 0 times u. This guy is a geometric vector so it has to have an inverse negative 0u. So let's add that to both sides. Negative u on both sides. What does that give me? On this side I'm going to have 0u plus negative 0u and this is going to equal 0u plus 0u plus the negative of 0u. I'm adding the additive inverse of 0u. On this side a vector plus its additive inverse gives me 0 vector. Here I'm going to associate the brackets. So this is going to equal 0u plus 0u plus the negative of 0u. Same thing on this side. This is now 0, so this will give me 0u plus 0. 
zero leaves somebody alone. So that gives me zero times u is equal to zero. And that concludes using transitivity a bunch of times that zero is in fact zero times u. You can also flip it around if you want, but close enough. That one's done. Let's do number four. The last one that I'm gonna prove four or one before five. What this is saying is if you multiply a vector, scalar multiplied by negative one, that gives you the additive inverse of u. What I'm gonna use lazily is property one that said inverses are unique, and then just show that negative one times u is an inverse, and therefore it has to be the inverse. What? Watch. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna start with negative u again, and I wanna know if that's the inverse, but what do we know about an inverse? By definition, u plus whatever that inverse is, say, should equal zero. So if I'm trying to show that this thing I claim is the inverse, what we're saying here is that this guy, negative u, is zero. And I want to show the left-hand side is that guy. So what I'm going to have to do is take u and add negative one times u and see whether we get zero. That's the goal. And that's exactly what happens. So let's do this plus u. What do I get? Well, axiom 10 says everyone nods because I read it like this. One times u is u. But really, I'm going to use it this way now. u is, I can introduce one. So this is equal to immediately negative one u plus one times u. Now I also have, everyone nods, but I have alpha plus beta u is equal alpha u plus beta u. But I'm gonna use it this direction. I see I have u in both terms, I can factor it out. And that will give me negative one plus one times u by the distribution property in reverse. Now what does that give me? Luckily in the real numbers, negative one plus one is the number is zero. And we just proved that in two, that that is in fact the zero vector. Therefore, negative one times u plus u is equal to the zero vector. Inverses are unique, and therefore that says that negative one times u must be the additive inverse of u. And that's what we mean by that. I know, pause, meditate on this, but this is the structure axiomatically of inverses are unique and the additive inverse of u is negative one times u. Scalar multiplying a vector by negative one is like flipping it in space. Now what we're gonna do is linear combinations and spanning sets. Okay, definition, we're gonna throw them all into one. You can pause at some point if you want to go back, but we're gonna do linear combination and spanning set all in one go. Let B, first of all, we're gonna have a bunch of vectors in space eventually. We're gonna go dimension-wise in the next few videos in one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, and then I can't picture them. We, we can mathematically do any dimension we want. So suppose you have a collection of K vectors in a set, V1 to VK. Then another vector, U, say, is a linear combination of those vectors. If we can write U as this. Linear, again, in all contexts mean that every term is either a constant or a multiple of a single variable. In this case, our variables are gonna be our vectors, so we're saying linear is gonna be scalar multiples. These are our two binary operations. Scalar multiplication of a vector times a uh, scalar and adding geometric vectors. If we can, in some way, write U as the combination of adding a bunch of those vectors, possibly multiplied by coefficients, this is what we mean by U can be written as a linear combination of those other vectors. The whole goal is to find a magic set called the basis, which has a couple properties, and then we can describe every vector in that n-dimensional space with just n vectors called a basis. So first we wanna be able to know, can we describe everybody, which is can we write them as linear combinations or express vectors through other vectors? And then we wanna do it uniquely, so we have a unique description of every vector in n space just through n vectors. That's the goal eventually. Right now, linear combination is, if you can write it as this linear expression, U can be written as a linear combination of V1 to VK, where we're gonna specifically call alpha one to alpha K coefficients of this linear combination. This is actually where you're going to, this vector, if it is a basis, where U will get coordinates with respect to that basis will be the coefficients in this linear combination. You'll see when we get there. The other thing we're gonna do is once we have that, this is just one linear combination. I have a set of vectors. This guy U happens to be one linear combination of those vectors. 
the spanning set now, which we're going to call span B or span of those vectors, is the set of all possible linear combinations of those vectors. Right now, what you want to memorize from the whole scene was this last sentence. U is in the span of vectors if and only if I could write U as a linear combination of those vectors. So when I ask, is this vector U in the span of these other two vectors? You're I'm going to do it right away in an example. Like what? Yeah, all I'm asking is, can I write it as v1 plus v2 with some coefficients possibly in there. That's all we're asking. Again, u is in the span of a set of vectors if and only if I can write u as a linear combination of those vectors because the span is all possible linear combinations. Let's do an example. All right, our first example will just show the basics, what I mean by being in the span of something. This vector u, I claim, first of all, there they are, no one likes this, but there's a willy-nilly in the plane and b and c, there they are, there's vectors. What I do is, I'm going to construct u out of uh, addition of vectors and scalar multiplication. Nobody likes this, so first of all, independently do it. A, I'm going to scalar multiply by a factor of 2, so it's going to get twice as long. There it is. Not to scale, possibly. B, then I'm going to multiply by 3 and get 3 of them. There it is. And then plus negative 5 times C is technically what that is, of lazy. That minus 5C is plus negative 5 times C. So there's C. When I multiply it by the negative, it'll flip it to its antipode, and then I'm just going to stretch it by 5 units, so this should be negative 5c. When I take tip to tail, tip to tail, when I'm going to add 3 vectors, that's what I'm going to get, and that will be the resultant vector that I geometrically construct from the linear combination of those 3 vectors. Because I can write u geometrically like this, or algebraically as a linear combination of those guys, that's going to tell me that u is in the span of ABC because I can write U as a linear combination of ABC. This is what we mean. And pictorially, hopefully, that makes it very clear. We are not adding apples in the basket. We are constructing a geometric vector from three other vectors. Next. All right, example two, we're going to show that the diagonals D1 and D2 of a parallelogram determined by two vectors U and V are both in the span of U and V. First of all, what the heck does that mean? Oh, this is Noodles. He wanted to say, hey, what's up? Mostly he wants outside, and I'm not going to let him out until I'm done the video. you got to wait, kitty. What do we mean by a parallelogram determined by U and V? Normally what we do is we pick one of the corners of a parallelogram, and then U and V will be emanating from the same place, from the same point A, say. But before I start my argument of addition of geometric vectors in this diagram, it should be pointed out that even though I called this V and this U, the other side of the parallelogram opposite u is also the vector u. This vector and this vector are going in the same direction and they both have the same magnitude or length. Therefore, this one is also u and this one is also the vector v when I make my construction. Let's do the easy one first. Let's call this one diagonal 1. And how am I going to show that this vector d1 is in the span of u and v? Well, D1, I picked the easy one first. It's right in the definition, and then I'll give you the definition of subtraction by rote in a second also. D is literally, take this, ignore the second half now, and that's why I pointed this out. This vector is also V. And so from this diagram, that is the definition of geometric addition. That tells me by definition, this vector plus this vector is equal to that vector. And so that tells me that U plus V is equal to D1 by the definition of geometric addition. What does that tell me? To nail it on the head, this is specifically 1 times u plus 1 times v, and that says d1 is in the span of u v by definition. You get in there if and only if I can write you as a linear combination. This is the definition of addition. Now what's the other one I want? The other one I want is say that one put the arrow that way. Who is that guy? Let's call that D2. Now what we're going to have to do is be careful. That is addition, but then we're going to have to use subtraction, or that's the subtraction operation also, depending on the way you want to view that. From that picture, this one plus this one now, U plus D2 is equal to V. Or, what is D2? How am I going to solve for this? I know that I want D2 by itself, so I have an additive inverse of U, so I can multiply or add that to both sides. That's going to give me negative u plus u plus d2 is equal to negative u plus v. These two will combine to give me the zero vector. Zero vector leaves them alone. I'm being lazy, but 
do all the steps and that's going to tell me that d2 is, I can also commute these, this is axiom 2, even though it's a negative, and this is b minus u. Or to hit it on its head, that tells me that u plus d2 is equal to b, or d2 is equal to b minus u, which is, we have to put them in the right order, I should have left them the first time. That's just convenient for us, but if we want to put them specifically in the order, we want to put u first always and b first when we start talking about a basis, so I'll prep you now. This is going to be, let me write this as negative 1 times u plus 1 times b. Either way, I have d2 is also a linear combination of u and b, and that says that d2 is also in the span of the sides of that parallelogram. I can always write the diagonals in a parallelogram as linear combinations of the sides of that parallelogram. And this is where you start getting parallelogram laws and stuff like that once we get norm in the next couple sections. Let's do one more example. In our last example, we should point out that any two collinear vectors or any two vectors in the same direction, whether co-directed or oppositely directed, if they're in this direction, they're always scalar multiples of each other. That should become Pavlovian. There's going to be two Pavlovian conditions we have for geometric vectors. They're perpendicular if and only if their dot product is zero will be Pavlovian eventually. And vectors are collinear or in the same direction if and only if they're multiples of each other. If they're all pointed in the same direction, either they're all equal to each other because when are vectors equal? If they're the same direction, have the same magnitude. So if they're the same direction and they're not equal, the only thing that could differ is their multiples of each other. So therefore, they have to be scalar multiples of each other. And if I can write u as alpha b where alpha is not zero, I can multiply both sides by the multiplicative inverse of alpha to get b is 1 over alpha u. What does this statement say? Well, <laughs> this statement says that u is in the span of v because I can write u as a linear combination of v. There's only one of them, so I don't need pluses. And then... Statement 2 says v has to be in the span of u because v is also a scalar multiple 1 over alpha of u. Therefore, when vectors are in the same direction, either they're identically equal to each other or they're scalar multiples of each other. Either way, they're in the span of each other. This is extremely useful. Please subscribe right here. Hit the notification bell. I'll see you next time.